great guy. Uh, you know him from 24. He was on The Sopranos, played a great character. And uh, he's done stuff all the way from Natural Born Killers to, to uh, Jersey Boys. So, you know, this is uh, Louis Lombardi, guys. Hey! The way these people treat you, I'm here one day, and I kind of feel like I'm home. So, yeah. You got cut out of the show I'm doing now. I put a skinny guy, Phil, you know Phil? Yeah. I put Fat Phil instead. I was going for a thinner, I was going for a thinner younger guy. So. That's it. Am I done talking? <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from the Bronx. Nice. Yeah. Anybody else from the Bronx? From Morris Park over there. The Sopranos. How do I? How'd they find you for the Sopranos? Well, they didn't find me. You know, I'm an actor, so you auditioned for roles. You know? And uh, I did a show before that in Hawaii with Malcolm McDowell, which was a Fantasy Island. It was a remake of Fantasy Island. And when that show got canceled, I moved went to New York and, uh, you know, I was very fortunate enough, which I'm very proud of, is to play an FBI agent. You know, I'm tired of very Italian-American being a gangster, spitting on each other, or being a, you know... Oh, there you go, that's my point. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my point about it. Oh, oh, picky ring, the, the toothpick, you know? But that's exactly, you know, you know and, I, and I get a lot of, like, from law enforcement saying, you know, I have a huge following from, like, law enforcement saying, it's so good to see an Italian-American play a good guy. You know, everybody's so glamorized with the Soprano, Soprano, Sopranos, and I try to go, yeah, it's a television show, but would you want your kid being a real Soprano guy, being in jail, killing people, selling drugs? Who in the room wants their children or people to do that? My son. You, of course. Is that ready? Who's over there? From, you know, so much from people saying, yeah, 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 I kind of like, you know, it's nice to see Italian Americans not be the gangsters, right? And I wrote, directed, started, and produced my first movie, and it was not about gangsters. It was about family who owned a bakery in the Bronx. You know, trying to make it more about family. And that's what that, and he saw the movie, he has a copy of it. I don't know who else has seen the film. You can watch it on Netflix, you know? Called Doughboys. And it's about two brothers who own a bakery in the Bronx. And I try to get away from the Italian American stereotypical kind of gangster stuff. And I'm proud about my career has not been that, as an Italian-American from the Bronx, you know? And that's just, you know, that's something that I'm really proud of, you know? So, and I don't play, I play a cop in more stuff than I do gangster in anything. And I think that's a, you know, everybody should pride themselves on that, because whoever wants their kids to be gangsters, it's gotta be out of their mind. You wanna go visit your son in jail? You wanna go visit your son in a grave? All right, clap that. You know, I lived and I grew up, and, and I, unfortunately, that was my life before I was an actor, and when I decided to do something different with my life, look what happened. I changed my life, and I kind of don't agree with that, st that kind of stuff now. So, so how did you get into acting? Then? Uh, so when I was a kid. I was like 13 years old, and I didn't have money. I, I was a street guy, like Vinny said, and, you know, we grew up, you know, you know with no one. My mother brought up two boys alone. And I always wanted to be an actor, and all my gangster friends would say, what the fuck is an actor? What are you going to be as an actor? And I'd be like, what do you mean? Because you have a dream to get out of where you are? Something wrong with you? So as a kid, I had no money to go to school. I went to fifth grade. And I would do NYU films as an actor, learn how to, learn how to act for free, because I didn't have money to go to acting school, and I didn't have patience to sit in a classroom. And I would learn how to act for free at NYU films. Also, I would learn how to make films. I had $50,000 a year education at NYU. I would learn for free. So I would show up. And, you know, what you want to learn, you can learn. What you don't want to learn, you just because you don't want to learn. And I learned how to act for free and make movies for free from 13 years old. And look what happened. I kind of put my passion through. And I was fortunate enough to learn how to make movies and be an actor. You know? And I did it all self-taught. I went to fifth grade. I've written 20 scripts. You know, I then went to film school, I've written, directed, started, produced three films. You know, so you can do what you want to do, you know, it's not just because where you're from, whether it be the ghetto or whether it be the Bronx, which is somewhat of a ghetto. It's not a bad way, but that's the mentality people have. I know people from the Bronx who go, I go, come visit LA. All the way there? I'm like, it's a fucking plane right away. It ain't like you're walking to LA on a back, you're not going to die on, you know, it's in 1835. You know, so that mentality still sits with people, you know? 
you know, explore, do stuff, do what you feel like doing. When I, like I said, when I wanted to be an actor, they all told me I was crazy. They were all getting out of prison, and I've been in 50 films and 10 TV series, so I'm very fortunate enough to, you know, change my life around and to be here talking to you. Do you actually have to audition? Yeah, of course, you still audition. This business has changed so dramatically that they're, they used to make, say, 50 movies a year, they make 10. The time slots on television, everyone thinks because you're on, you know, you watch so much TV that they make 57, 80 shows like they used to a year. No, the time slots have shrunk down from, you gotta remember, the only time slots there are on TV from 8 to 11, five major networks, and most of them a lot. Most of those shows. A reality. But a reality show. So you might have 10 shows on TV, it looks so big. But there's only, still, there's only 10, 12 shows on television, the rest are reality, you know? So that has shrunk down. When I first moved here 23 years ago, then you, you know, you were auditioning for every show, and every single, there was no real, you know, survival was reality. The real world was reality shows. Now it's like Honey Boo Boo, and fucking, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, the, 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 what, what, what Hollywood has done is shrunk everything down, and they gave it away, which has destroyed Hollywood. Netflix was the downfall of Hollywood. The internet was like the downfall of our society, I believe. It made our kids lazy slobs. When we were young, most of us used to go out and play basketball, sports, whatever, right? Now what do they do? They sit behind their computers and their phones. There's no more social skills because what do they do? Text. You can't have a conversation with kids these days. It's like, what do you do? And then you try to ask them a question and then you frighten them because they don't have to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But even communicating skills are gone. You know, I think the internet knocked out all businesses, mom and pop stores. They knocked out remember, good guys and all best buys and, and all these mom and pop stores. Now you go to Amazon. How lazy did that make people? I think the internet was one of the worst things that's happened. The music business, biggest example. You used to go out and buy a, a CD, $19. Now it's a dollar for the song and you're done. So instead of making $19 million on a million, you're making a million. Who, who's, who's, you know, the, the, biz, the, the, the business self-destructed and imploded within themselves. They got greedy. Everyone was trying to chase the internet. Into that, we're gonna make it. And they gave it all away. Blockbusters was the best thing that ever happened to our business. 45, 50 billion a year Blockbuster was making. Okay? At its prime. Biggest, it went from 15 years to being one of the biggest companies in America, profit-wise. And all those movies you see on Netflix were on the Blockbuster shelves. They used to reference three dollars. I spoke to the owner of Blockbuster many years ago, before it was starting to crumble. And I told him, don't do the Netflix thing. Try to reinvent the blockbusters into like, like remember Radio City musicals? Kind of make them where people can go in and watch a movie for a certain amount. Not like a theater, but kind of watch them, participate. Have like movie style th feelings. Re reinvent the blockbusters. He told me I was crazy. Where are they now? Right. Uh, out of business. 45 billion a year for 15 years. Out of business. It was a short run, but you know, there's no more DVD sales. There's no more anything. So the whole movie business has decimated, it destroyed itself. By by by, by by thinking that the internet was going to be its savior, which ended up being the worst thing ever for our country in every single way possible. That's just that's what I believe, you know. You know, let's, I know most of us are the same kind of, you know, kind of like not age, but kind of like shape. Yeah. <laughs> 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 No one sat down one day, and then we were young. We would all sit around and sit there for hours. Sunday dinner. Sunday dinner. Yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. Yeah. I was in New York. Yeah. It's gone. And all our kids are out yeah. in their rooms yeah. on their phones, and no one sits around. So you know, it's not like the kids' fault. It's the it's parents', parents fault. Right. And like the best role they think I've ever had was 24. You know, 24 was one. Of, it was like the hardest role I ever played. You know, and Sopranos. Sopranos was a great role for me. Because again, I get to play an FBI agent where I was so I was the only I was the most different character on the whole show. So you have fifty characters, and my character was the most unique and different character. And you know, you know what the funny part is? Is when I go around now, you get all these people, and they go, "Hey, you're the fucking rat." I go, "What? <laughs> Wait a second, pussy." There's a dear friend of mine for thirty years. Great guy. We know each other back, back, back in the days. Yes. He's a drug dealer who beats his wife, who has cancer, sells drugs, kills people, and is, a, and is, a, and is a, a rat ratting on his brothers. And I'm the rat. <laughs> Tell me what's wrong with our society. I don't get it. And I, I actually confront people now and go, what are you talking about? I'm the rat. I'm the cop busting the bad guy. So let me ask anybody in this room a question. If you had a daughter, 
and she was being beat up by a drug dealer, abused. You guys would condone that? You'd be like, great, because he's a drug dealer? Or I'm calling he's you. A gangster? He's he's a no, we're kidding. We're right. calling you. I don't understand your mentality. I don't understand people's mentality. And it's not just New York. It's people all around the country, everywhere I go. And when, we, when I was younger, if you went to school and you kind of talked back to your teacher, what would your mother do? Smash you, right? These days, you go into a school, the kid spits on a teacher, a parent shows up and tells the teacher, don't you fucking tell my kid what to do. You're like, no, you should be telling your kid what to do. And your kid wouldn't be a scumbag Gavon who carrying a knife and gun to school. Like Vinny was saying, where I came from made me who I am. So, I'm from the Bronx. Said that 20 fucking times. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the fuck is the fuck I'm saying, really? You work for me. On a show like that, when they when they decide to kill off the character, when it's a character that's that strong, we felt like that character was going to be, you know, like a Chloe that would be there forever. How is is that decided? Uh, financial reasons? Is it just no, part it's just of the script? decided that they thought that they were going to shock the audience. What they did was they turned the audience off, and if you know, after that, I mean. They've never got it. They've never after the fifth season when I was on, we got killed. We won an Emmy. It was the only eight years they ever won an Emmy was that season. Okay, we were nominated the year before. We didn't win to lost. We lost to lost actually. Then we won on the next season when I got killed. After they killed me, the audience got so turned off that they thought they were going to shock the audience, but they actually turned the audience off. And yeah, we were kind of. We, I was one of those. They lost ten million viewers. After that, Jeez. when I was on the show, it was nine million viewers on the fourth and fifth, the third and fourth season. Oh no, before the fourth and fifth. When we did the fourth and fifth season, it became a character-driven show, not just the premise of twenty-four. Exactly. Whatever. So people started loving the dynamic between me and Chloe, yep. between Curtis and uh, the other girl, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Carlos and, and Rico. People started liking the characters. It became a character-driven show. Then they started killing off all the characters that people liked. And when they killed my character, because I had the president of Fox come up to me and said, hey man, it wasn't our idea. We wanted you on. So when did you find out? The week before. Really? Yeah. And, and, and people were like, what are you doing? You're killing one of the most... They were like, yeah, I'm going to shock the audience. It'll be great. It's like, yeah. turn the audience off. And after that, the fifth season, they, they were never even nominated again. Edgar was like my favorite role, you know? Yeah. And it was, a hard, it was hard doing it because my mom dies in the first season. So, you know, going through a whole year and a half of crying every day, you know, it's one day. People don't get it. So every day, you know, it's still that one day. You're showing up every day, five days a week, 15 hours a day, eight months out of the year, still with that crying mentality of walking around sad every day. You know, it wasn't like, hey, today's going to be, I'm going to have fun. It was the same day. So you still got to carry throughout. People don't get that. You know, people do, you know, that started, actually, it took a little toll, you know, every day. I was to rehearse it, being sad and crying, and then showing up that next day, doing crying. You got to remember, it's within an eight-hour span, you know? Yeah. So, I think 24 was one of my favorite roles, and, you know, I wish them the best. Those writers were great writers, and I don't know whose choice it was to get me off the show, but, you know, not that I'm saying the show went on without me or whatever, but I think they started killing off too many main KD characters that kind of turned people off. I think it's uh, yes. Thank you for having me. This is great. It's like being a part of it. It's like being a part of it. No, no, I won't come back. Just remind me where the food's up. Yeah. <laughs>